have some fun? Um, I was thinking that maybe tonight we should all just repent. Uh, yes. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> As I've been journeying with Jesus, uh, oh, that's a little bit loud, eh? Oh, that's a bit better. As I've been journeying with Jesus for the last little while, really, really since my DTS here back in 2001, um, I've kind of picked up on this thing that repentance is really good for me. Anybody figured that out yet? Um, who wants a greater measure of freedom in their life? Who wants, who actually, think about this for a minute, think about this for a minute. Who wants to be able to move in a, in a deeper, more powerful way of being able to love unconditionally? Um, okay, if we're going to get there, we're going to have to repent, I think. <laughs> um, so it's good for us, but, um, so that's where we're going to kind of, we're going to kind of move towards tonight, and I just want to get healed up. You know, one thing I've noticed about Jesus is that he seems to always be in the mood for healing, like always, you know. And, um, and so I think that's what I've got faith for tonight. I've got faith for the, the healing of our hearts and, um, and just get stuff right with God and to get closer with each other, really, um, and get closer with God. Have you noticed how those two things go so hand in hand, you know? It's hard to, you know... Have you ever had a season of your life where you were like, man, I felt so isolated and totally by myself, and yet my relationship with God was flourishing? Probably not. We tend to flourish in our connection with God within the context of community and love and intimacy. But, um, you know, friends, I just want you to know I feel super duper honored um, to be here uh, sharing my heart. Um, as Hannah said, I did my DTS back here in 2001. Um, back at the at the warehouse, um, back when we I don't think we had the warehouse for very long at that point. We were really just renovating it, eh, Watto? When I say we, I mean Watto, <laughs> and <laughs> and a whole bunch of us <laughs> trying not to screw up what he was doing, um, basically. So I just want to acknowledge, um, man, the people who have gone before me. This place, Townsville, is such a precious part of my journey, eh? Um, I arrived here as such a confused and um, really depressed 18-year-old uh, kid who um, really had, because of the family that I grew up in in Wyoming, really had an understanding of li what, what life with Jesus was supposed to be like, um, but was just totally not experiencing that at all and felt extremely disconnected from the Heavenly Father. And um, I really arrived here. I remember you know, flying over here, being on the plane from L.A., thinking to myself, and I think I even wrote down in this little journal, um, I'm just going to get over there, and for the first time in my life, I'm just going to be totally flippant honest about how screwed up I actually am. And, and I just hope they can take it. And if, if these people can't take it, then I guess I'll just come home. Um, but it'll be worth a shot. <laughs> and, um, and actually, I experienced unconditional love, you know, through that. But you can only be loved if you're willing to be known. Have you picked up on that? You can't, if you hide in the shadow, there's only so, you know, you actually, you protect yourself, but then you, but then you also protect, your, you protect yourself from wounding from people, but you also protect yourself from love. And so we have to make a choice to be known, to actually expose the truth of what's really going on inside of us, what's really happening with us, to actually be able to experience unconditional love. That's what I experienced, Ken, you know, did our openness and brokenness week on, on week two, and I just, I was the first one up there, just spilled my guts for like 20 minutes about every stupid thing I've ever done, you know, all the stuff that I felt ashamed over, and then after like 20 minutes, Ken was like, yeah, okay, that's enough, <laughs> you know, <laughs> pulled me into his big old chest, and I'm pretty sure I ruined his t-shirt, um, so this is a really special place for me as I just, um, you know, Cora, we were driving up Castle Hill the other night and Cora was asking me, what's it like, you know, to be back here? And, and I just think, man, I just have a thousand incredible memories of my time, my, my DTS experience and what a, a revolution it was for me. And so I'm so grateful, you know, I'm so grateful for, for Tanga Tefenua, the host people of the land here um, who have gone before us. Um, and I'm so grateful for Ken and Robin. I'm so grateful for Joe and, and Wada. Is Joe here? No? She's around somewhere. Um, so I'm kind of returning as a, hopefully not a prodigal son, but, you know, as a, 
as a son um, in this place. I'm proud to be here. You know, that's why I thought, I was looking at what I should wear, and I was like, I'm going to support my new YWAM ship shirt. Come on. Yeah, man. <laughs> when in Rome. Um, yeah. So I want to talk, I really want to pick up on this thing that Hannah was talking about in, in relation to love and connection and really this thing of covenantal love um, that we are born for, that we're created for because we're created in the image of God and we can see from scripture that start to finish, this is what is motivating everything that God does is, is covenantal love. Um, and since Cora and I got married back in 2004, um, is she still back there? Cora, are you still there? She's hanging out with my son, Levi. Um, hey, babe. So I'm here with my family, which is beautiful. Um, ever since Cora and I got married back in 2004, man, did we not know what we were getting ourselves into. I, um, I think I was 20, she was 22. We've been on this journey together of what does it actually look like for us as followers of Christ to make um, the priority of God, the motivation of God, which is covenantal love, to make that our priority. What if everything we did, the ministry we do, the food we eat, the, you know, the way we share our lives together, what if everything we did like God was coming from the place of the, the motivation of covenantal love, that no matter what, I'm going to stay connected to you. And that's really, when I say covenantal love, that's really what I mean, is when you choose within your own heart, out of the volition of your own will, just like Jesus did, you choose. Say to somebody, I'm going to stay connected to you. As far as my half of this relationship, no matter what we go through, I am going to stay connected to you. Um, and that's kind of nice to say, um, but man, life just throws you some curly ones, eh? <laughs> Has anyone here just experienced something where you just, where there was, you know, a connection with somebody that started out so beautiful and so wonderful? There was so much chemistry and it just came together. You know, you may feel that way about your spouse. Hopefully you still feel that way about your spouse <laughs> um, or friendship. And then, whoa, something goes down that is just unsavory, something that you couldn't have anticipated. And you find yourself just wanting to smash this person that you once loved. You know, and all of us to a degree experience this within our families that we grow up in because whether we like it or not, we are born with the anticipation. Because we're created in the image of God, we're born with the anticipation of perfect unconditional love. Have you noticed that about yourself? Have you ever thought, man, I wish I could just sort of turn off this need for love. It gets me into all kinds of trouble. It would be kind of nice, wouldn't it? And you could just be stoic and angelic and holy, you know? And you wouldn't be so needy. But the truth is we're created to experience, to give and to receive unconditional love. Um, oh, buddy. Here it comes. So what do we do with this? You know, we're, we're, born, we're created in the image of God. And, you, and you, you, whether you like it or not, I mean, even the most staunch atheist in the world somewhere inside knows intuitively that my mom and dad are supposed to stay together and I'm supposed to be loved. They're supposed to love me more than they love themselves. You, you know what I mean? Like everybody, that is just in the script of the human heart. My, my, my mom and dad are supposed to love each other and they're supposed to put me first. And you're born with that anticipation. And I don't know about you. I mean, man, a lot, you know, a lot of you guys actually know my parents. I mean, I have the most amazing parents. But I'll tell you what, you know, I haven't experienced total perfect unconditional love. They would be the first ones to admit that, you know, me and my brothers and, and Rachel, my beautiful sister who's up the back. Can I get an amen, Rach? <laughs> we, you know, that you, ex you encounter. And my kids have already, you know, have already encountered the imperfection. Hey, Kiana, have you encountered the imperfection of my love? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and so we go through stuff that hurts, man. That hurts, and it's disappointing, and it's painful. And, um, and we see Jesus calling us and modeling to us this standard 
that he wants us to see in his life, to receive from him. Because he's had it the toughest of all of us. I mean, the one who loves most is the most vulnerable, right? The one who extends his heart the most is the most vulnerable. Kiana and I were talking about this driving down the road the other day. We were listening to the story of this 15-year-old boy in Parramatta. Um, and, and Kiana was asking me, what's, what's that all about, Dad? What's happened? I was explaining this 15-year-old boy went and shot this person, you know. And, and, um, and we just paused for a moment and reflected what it must feel like in the heart of Jesus. You know, we have the luxury of not being aware, you know, of the atrocity that happens, you know, even just around us right now in this neighborhood. But Jesus is aware, and he endures so much. I mean, has Jesus endured so much from your life? Man, Jesus has endured so much through my life, and yet his unconditional pursuit of me, it just marches on, just relentless, you know? It's just relentless. It's unflippin' believable. And so he calls us, he models it to us, and then he calls us to walk in that kind of unconditional love, that we would, that we would walk in that. And he does this crazy, crazy thing before he ascends to be with his dad. He prays this prayer where he says, okay, dad, this is what I want. I want them to be as perfect in their relationship with each other as your and I's relationship is. And you just look at that and you just go, that's cute, Jesus. (laughs) But, you know, not really, right? Um, and yet here we, we've got to deal with that. We've got to be confronted by that, this standard of the, what the dream in our Jesus' heart. This is the dream in his heart. This is his priority. This is what he said was precious to him. This is what he wants. And we see there Paul backing him up saying, you know, you can, you can move mountains. You can speak every time. I mean, seriously, imagine for a second how freaked out and impressed you would be with me if I went, okay, guys, check this out. This is what I'm going to do tonight. And I just, like, picked up this monitor speaker and just, like, floated it across the room and put it back. You would all be like, what? You know? And I'd be on the news tomorrow, and it would just be the most impressive thing in the world, wouldn't it? I mean, what would, would how impressive would that be? And yet, Paul says, it is a total nonsense. It absolutely, completely, and utterly nothing if it is not on the foundation of self-sacrificial, unconditional love. And so this is our calling as followers of Christ, to gather people around us and to say, hey, I am going to stay connected to you. We're gonna, and you know what, Aussies? Like, this is what I learned here in Australia. This is what I learned. I didn't have a clue about any of this. But when I came here and I saw the way we do friendship here, or we we say mateship, where we stay connected. You know, this is, and so I know I'm preaching to the choir here. I know this is our bread and butter, but I want to exhort you again that this is what is so precious. And all of us, you may not be Australian, but you've come into, you've come, you know, into Australia. You've come under the spiritual covering of spiritual mothers and fathers who are Australian. And so this, I'm speaking to you as well. Um, so Cora and I, you know, we got married and we started grappling uh, with what does it look like for unconditional love to be the foundation of what we do in ministry in particular. We were working with YWAM in Newcastle and our base leader um, at the time, someone who is such an important person in my life. I met him while I was doing my DTS up here. He's a guy named Dave Stevenson and he was speaking on the Holy Spirit. And he just got us all messed up, just totally freaked out and messed up. And I was just like, I asked Jesus during his week, I said, God, could I please cancel all my other plans and just go and do whatever that guy is doing? And I, Jesus didn't answer me up until the last like, week of my, of my DTS. And he said, yes, okay, you can go and serve that guy. So I did. And he had this phrase. He would talk about friends together in ministry that fundamentally, first and foremost, We're friends who go out together in ministry, and Cor and I were grappling with this. And we, you know what happened to you guys? We, God, in 2007, um, God spoke to Cor and I um, that he wanted to send us um, over to New Zealand. Now, my my dad is from West Auckland in New Zealand. My mom's Californian, so I'm kind of a, a New Zealander and an American. People say, which one are you? And I say, 
I'm both. You just have to deal with that. Um, any, anybody else, that dual nationality people up in here? Cool. My homies. Um, and so we came to New Zealand, and you know what, you guys? We had so much promise. We had all these passages from Scripture um, about entering into the promised land, and it's going to be milk and honey, you know, and all this epic stuff. And we're going to have wide open spaces to really explore who we are. Because, you know, at that point for eight years, and it was beautiful and wonderful, but for eight years, I, I served, Cor and I just served our butts off in that YWAM context. And whatever that community needed, we did. And it was good for me to learn to serve in that context. I ran the kitchen. I ran accounts receivable. That was probably my least favorite. Um, I ran, but the kitchen was the hardest. Who are my kitchen people up in here? The, the mad, you know, props to these guys. There is nowhere on the YWAM base that, that more people will be immediately affected if you screw up your job than, than the kitchen. And I learned that. Everybody should take some time to not just do work duties in the kitchen, but actually run the kitchen and feel the weight every single day of everyone's hunger. You know, it's actually pretty intense. Um, so, I, you know, I ran that. I was in, you know, band ministries, touring all around New South Wales. You know, you name it, I, you know, we did it in that environment. And, um, and so we were excited coming into New Zealand. We were going to explore the unique thing that we were carrying in our hearts. And, and uh, you know what, you guys? We arrived in New, into New Zealand, and basically the wheels just fell off. Like, everything that could go wrong went wrong. You know, what's beyond pear-shaped? It went, like, pumpkin-shaped. Um, you know, it just, it was, you know, every, it was so painful. It was so intense. Eva was born, um, and she had really gnarly colic. She would scream and scream and scream. We were totally isolated. We didn't have any friends, you know, in the place that we went to. We had just bought a house. You know, that year, we, we bought a house, renovated a house, had a baby, and moved overseas all in the same year. You know, not something I would recommend. Probably something that I won't do again. Um, but, but we arrived, and, and what we went through was like every week got worse, you know, than the last um, and, it, you know, our house was getting foreclosed upon. Remember that we had the 2008 global financial crisis, right? And so our interest rate, rate went from like 7.2% to 11.6%. Uh, and so all of a sudden we're coming up. And this is I'm like we're paying our mortgage out of our support money. You know, it's like what do you do when all of a sudden your, your um, monthly expense doubles, you know, go like an extra thousand bucks? It's, it's just intense, you know, and you got a family. And uh, I got a job working at a, at a plastics factory, doing night shifts at a plastics factory, um, which was awesome. Uh, I went from being the training director at Wyman Newcastle with about you know, 30 staff under my leadership and all these students and feeling like the man, you know, walking around the base, you know, as this young leader with all this responsibility, super, super fly. And, uh, and then like a month later, I was the plastics factory, you know, uh, floor worker, working 8 p.m. to to 8 a.m. every night, and my boss was like a 16-year-old kid. Um, and I have a picture of me with, with cuts on all 10 digits of my fingers the first night that I worked there because I was so exhausted by 3 in the morning, and you're like slicing plastic over and over. I've got a Band-Aid on all 10 fingers. It was humiliating, you know. It was really humiliating. And I remember going out in our smoko break and, and, um, and asking and just going, Jesus, like, what the heck are you doing to me? Like, I thought you loved me, you know. <laughs> you said, you hate me, I knew it. And um, we laugh about it now, but you know, I'm hoping that you're laughing because you know what I'm talking about. You know what I mean? Those moments. It's like, God must be angry because my circumstances aren't going well. Oh, but then my circumstances are good. God must be happy. It's not really like that. And, you know, God asked me this question, you know, because all, all my fellow workers were all these young people, all these teenagers, and we had been doing all this youth ministry, and I felt the Holy Spirit asked me, Matt, do you still care about young people? And it was like when the lights fade, when my title is gone, when no one's watching, you know, when I have nothing to write in my newsletter except for the fact that I'm depressed and, and, and I've been a terrible husband lately and a terrible dad. That's my newsletter. Please support me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and I'm exhausted and I want to shoot myself. <laughs> you know? Even in this, I felt the Holy Spirit asked Matt, do you, do you still love young people? And you know what? Sometimes God, we think God tests us to prove how screwed up we are. You know, I don't think it's like that with God. I think God actually likes to bring us through stuff to reveal the glory of his kids, you know, to actually reveal the beauty of us. Um, and, some, and, you know, to my own amazement, you know, my answer to that question was yes. Even in the total despair of the situation, I, you know, by the grace of God, my answer was, yes, Father, I still do. And I got off my butt and I reached out to those kids, you know, and, um, and led a couple of them to the Lord. And it was actually beautiful. It was a beautiful process, but, man, it was painful. But that whole time where every week, you know, the bank is foreclosing on our house. And, and actually, I got a surprise in the, in the mail from the IRS back in the States. I mean, I arrived as, as an 18-year-old kid in Australia. Like, the last thing I'm thinking about is the IRS and my obligations back to Uncle Sam. You know, I was like, I don't even live in America. And then all of a sudden, Uncle Sam was like, knock, knock, knock. You owe the USA $16,000. And because we'd raised all this money to buy this house in Australia, and all of a sudden, we appeared on Uncle Sam's radar. And, um, and so, and like, we were just going, how could this nightmare get worse? And, you know, it was a beautiful thing um, because I don't believe that God designs difficult circumstances for his kids. I would never do that for my kids, and God's a lot better dad than I am. So I don't know if that messes with your theology, but you can just sort of chew on that one. Um, but I'll tell you what, he definitely knows how to use something terrible and turn it around and, use it and, and turn it into a blessing and, and make something beautiful out of something disgusting. And, um, and, you know, in that season of life, some deep things, some deep accusations against God that were lurking in our hearts that didn't come to the surface when we were, com when we were comfortable, but when we were really uncomfortable, some deep, like, you suck, God. You know, like, I just want to let you know that you suck. <laughs> I'm still going to worship you, but you suck, you know. What are you doing? Sometimes the most painful situations are, the, are the, the situations where you don't understand what God is doing, where you just don't understand what are you up to and you have no clarity. Why are you not healing my body? Why are you not healing this relationship? Why, why, why am I struggling with finance again? And you know what, you guys? Some those deep things came to the surface, and of course, Cor and I were massively tempted you know, the enemy is always looking for every opportunity he can to divide us, right? Because the enemy can't get at God. There's just nothing. He's got his, you know, his force field rocking. And there's just nothing that the enemy can throw at God. But he can get at God sideways by getting at us. And if he can divide us, you know, that's the most painful. And, you know, I remember asking Steve Ahern one time, our national leader here, what's the most painful thing you've ever experienced as a dad? This is before I had kids, and he says, when my kids don't treat each other well, this is the most painful thing. And you know what? As I've been a father, this, it is, and I've been open with my children about this. There is, this is the most painful thing as a father is when your children are unkind to each other. And so there was a massive temptation for Cora and I to turn on each other in this context. It's just the most, you know, just like in the garden, the easiest thing to do is you suck, but you only suck almost as bad as she sucks, you know? Why did you give me this man? Curse me with this person who's so imperfect. And, you know, I used to think that marriage was really about mutual comfort, that we will sort of meet, that we will sort of, like, finally, I have somebody to ease this pain in my life. And... You know what I mean? And, um, you know, it's a funny paradox. I'm glad you guys are laughing. You should be laughing. You know, there's a funny paradox. These, but the, we have these beliefs that lurk under our subconscious, though, don't we? You know what I'm talking about? You know, I wasn't aware of that. If you would have told me, I would have been like, no, marriage is about the glory of God or something really <laughs> spiritual. But, but when push comes to shove, you find out what you really believe, don't you? You find out those beliefs that are really down deep in there. When you're in a situation where you are not able to love this person unconditionally, no matter how much you strive to squeeze love out of your heart 
for this person because it's the right thing to do. All that keeps coming out is you suck, <laughs> you know, to your outreach leader, you know, or your staff member or your fellow student or your ministry partner. It's like, I love you unconditionally, but deep down, I'm imagining punching you in the face. You know, I don't know what this is like for girls, but I know for guys, or maybe it's just me, um, but I know something's not right when I'm like just on my day off and I'm like daydreaming and my, like all of a sudden I'm daydreaming about like winning an argument with this person and then grabbing them by the hair and like bashing them in the face with my knee. And I'm like, okay, why is my imagination going there? Like, something might not be right here, you know? So I've learned over the years that it's weird. It's weird if followers of Christ, full of the Holy Spirit, follow, follow me on this one, you guys. Can you agree with me on this? Followers of Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, redeemed. If we are not moving in unconditional love, it's weird. Can you guys agree with me on this? I'm not, when I'm saying it's weird, I don't mean it's uncommon. It is common, unfortunately, but we've got we've to agree this is not normal. This is not normal behavior. This isn't actually what's supposed to come out of us. When something other than unconditional and perfect love comes out of us, it's short, it falls short of the standard that Jesus has held. And we've got to take a step back and go, that's weird. Why would somebody who's full of the Holy Spirit totally renewed, offer something less than unconditional love. Because there's only one spirit, right? And the mind follows the spirit. So where is that coming from? Probably not the Holy Spirit. As so we go through, we go through stuff. And we, Cor and I went through this stuff, man. You know what happened? Is that after, after eight months, um, God completely rescued us. I canceled every speaking engagement I had. I canceled all of the ministry we were doing. We actually did communicate to our supporters and just said, look, the truth is, actually, we're not doing any ministry. We're just trying to survive right now. We're trying not to lose our house. We're trying not to kill any of members of our family. Um, we're trying. That's just a, that's just a joke, kids. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, we're, try, we're just hanging in there. And, and to our amazement, all of our supporters really hung in there, through, th hung in there with us through it. Um, but this one thing, I picked up the phone, I called Darcy McLaughlin to cancel this trip I had to the Gold Coast, and, and, um, and I felt the Holy Spirit apprehend me, say, put the phone down. It was the first thing I'd heard from the Holy Spirit in ages. I was like, yay! <laughs> and um, a sense from the Spirit, you know. This, I'm not on my DTS, it's like after being a you know, a leader in Youth for the Mission. What? I wasn't hearing from God? Yes, I went through a season of my life where I could not hear from God. It was terrible. It was awful. I'm Joy Dawson's grandson, and I couldn't hear from God. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I went, I went over to the goal. You know what, actually, I did? I, it was one of the most painful things for me at the time because I grew up in a staunch you know, like independent New Zealand male family, like me and my three brothers. You know, Rachel didn't come along and, and soften all of us until, you know, I was already 14 when she was born. But I grew up as the youngest of three boys, Kiwi blokes, and we don't need each other. You know, we just, we got our own thing going on, you know. And, and I remember weeping at 2 in the morning, and I was, we were in so much pain, and I called my dad, and I'd never done anything like this. You know, Mr. Big Wig, president of YWAM. And I called him up and I said, Dad, I don't care what you're doing right now. I don't care what kind of huge international conference move of God thing you're supposed to be leading right now. But I am dying over here. My family is struggling and I really need you to be a grandfather right now. I need you to just come over here and help just hold this child that needs a little bit more love than what we're able to give right now. And man, it was it was a tough call for me to make, um, to cry out for help and to and to really acknowledge, I, I just I just don't got this, you know what I mean? Have you ever had a moment like that, where your confidence in your own ability just gets totally shattered, and you just realize, you know what? I'm not going to get myself out of this. It's just not going to happen, no matter how hard I try, no matter how fast I run, I can apply 
all of my strength to this, but I'm just not going to get myself out of this situation. And, and he came. He totally did. He canceled some conference that he was probably supposed to lead, you know, that probably would have led to world revival and is why we're still here evangelizing. Um, <laughs> sorry, guys. <laughs> And he came, and he just, and, and I went off to the Gold Coast, you know, and he just came, and he just held Eva, you know, as a little baby, and just, and just helped. Um, and while we were over there, someone wrote us a check for $25,000. Like, the biggest gift we'd ever received up until that point was, I think, 2000 bucks. Someone wrote us a check for twenty five grand, had sold their, had done a, an official public offering in their company, totally wiped out our debt to the IRS and paid off. Um, what we'd owed towards our mortgage um, at that point. Um, that, was, um, that, was Wednesday, that was Wednesday morning. Monday morning, actually, Eva, for the first time in her life, she actually slept two hours, two and a half hours during the day. Cora called me up in tears and said, you will not believe what just happened. Eva had never slept more than maybe 15 minutes during the day, even as a newborn, um, which, you know, newborns are supposed to sleep pretty much all the time. That's kind of how it works so that you can recover from, you know, the birth and everything. And um, it was such a painful time for my wife. It was such a, you know, I just watched what she went through, and I still to this day, I just admire her so much for emerging from that soft before the Lord. Because, you know, you go through painful stuff, and you either get, you either get bitter or you get soft, eh? You know, depending on the way you position your heart. And so we had to deal with these accusations in our hearts against God. That, you know, Monday morning, God rescued us. Eva was healed. Wednesday morning, um, <clears throat> Wednesday morning, the situation, we got this person who wrote us this check for 25 grand. And Friday, um, I finished teaching, and I was doing the right thing. My relationship with um, a particular leader who I'd had, you know, I'd been serving with was under strain. And I felt God tell me to just go and visit this person. And it was kind of a hard thing for me to do at the time. Um, and, um, and so I went down, visited um, them, and, and as, I, as it turns out, they had, without me knowing about it, had actually gone out and organized a new renter, uh, organized a new property manager and found us a renter uh, sponsored by the Catholic Church for our house um, that was willing to pay this huge premium to rent our house because of its proximity to the university and in order for us to not take a bond. And so it was like twice, like double the rent of what we would normally have gotten. So this guy who here I thought I was doing the right thing, even though this person was ruining my life, you know, I went down and did the right thing and only to find out that behind my back this person was basically saving our butts and rescued us from losing our house. Um, and I came back so humbled, you guys. I just came back like rescued. You know, like, have you ever been, have you ever been out past the breakers and you, and you know, at the beach, and you just go, I'm not strong enough, and you just put your hand up. It's just that moment like, okay, I'm not getting through this. Put my hand up. I suck. I'm too weak. And someone rescues you, and everybody's around, and they're all, like, so stoked for the person who rescued you, and you just feel like a total dork, you know, because <clears throat> you just got rescued, you know, because you were too pathetic to get yourself back in. You know, that was the feeling I had. It was like, yay, I got rescued. <laughs> you know, it was so healthy for us, and we had, to, we had to actually grapple with, and you know what, we started, we stopped accusing God of stuff and started asking him for understanding. And you know what happened? You know what we found out? Actually, God showed us a bunch of choices that we had made that led to the circumstances that we were in. That's all it was. God wasn't designing this huge labyrinth of pain for us so that we would be, you know... Tested. Actually, we just made some stupid decisions, and we really needed, and, and the reality of those decisions caught up with us, and we had to endure through it. So I hadn't crossed my T's and dotted my I's with the IRS. You know, I had ignored some warnings about that. We had, you know, the colic had to do with some of our dietary stuff, you know, with, with ever. There was just, there was stuff going on. And, and we began to learn through that process about freedom. And, and what it actually looks like and how important and foundational freedom is in our connection with God and in our connection with each other. Because, you know, why is freedom so flippant important to Jesus? Have you noticed that freedom is that your freedom is even more important to Jesus than you are, than it is to you? Sorry, scratch, totally scratch what I just said because that was probably total heresy. Your freedom 
is so much more important to Jesus than it even is to you. Have you ever gotten to a point where you're like, okay, Jesus, enough freedom. I'm good. This will do, you know. You know. And Jesus is going more. Why is your freedom so important to the Lord? Do you know, if you are not totally free, Jesus doesn't get what he wants. Jesus doesn't get what he's after because love, love is actually defined in freedom. That's what makes Cora and I's relationship, that's what makes family, that's what makes covenantal love so flippin' powerful. It's even more powerful than my relationship with my children because this relationship I chose. I chose on that day, on August 14th of 2004, I made a decision that day. I looked this woman in the eyes who I was pretty sure was perfect at the time. And she's been pretty close to perfect, but, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and we looked at each other, and, and it, was, it was terrifying and beautiful because of the gravity of the situation. Now, imagine, imagine, replay that scenario, but this time I pull out, you know, a 45 Magnum, and I point it to her head at the altar, and she says, my love. Why have you got a gun in my face? <laughs> Wherefore art thou? You know? And I because that's how you speak at the altar. And I say, and I say, oh, don't worry about this. It's just in case you change your mind. I love you so much. I just want to make sure this all works out. You'd be going, okay, the beauty kind of disappeared. Remember Fred, you know, a couple weeks ago he talked about our gospel needs to be beautiful. Remember that? This is what it's, you know what's beautiful is freedom. What's beautiful is, is that it's free. It's freedom. It's a choice you make. And, and love cannot exist without freedom. And so we began to, so if this is the priority of God, you know, of, of doing life in this way through covenantal love, how do we, how do we let all of ministry flow out of that? Let's just check out, um, I'm, just, I'm winding it. Winding at home. Whoa, time is getting away from me. Sorry, guys. I'm a little bit excited. Um, is this okay? Okay, cool. Maybe before, you guys all know Ephesians 4 anyway, so I'll just read it out quickly instead of putting it up there. Um, but, you know, when we got, as we got through this, God began to say some crazy stuff to us. Check this out, you guys. Here's some, here's some of the wacky stuff God started speaking to us. God started saying, he said to us something that, that just has changed everything. He said, don't build something that can withstand a lack of love. Don't, in ministry, in whatever you do, God's saying, I don't do that. I don't build stuff that can exist without love. When love departs, everything should fall apart. Like when love departs between you and the Father, does he play pretendies with you? Does he? Seriously, you guys, does God, when you are behind the scenes, you know, full of shame and stuff. Does God play pretendies with you? He doesn't. God does not build stuff that can withstand a lack of real, genuine love. I thought, man, what would it look like if we did that? If we didn't build anything? And I realized in ministry so often when I wanted to reach out to create some structure around something, it was usually a fear in my heart I wanted to bolster up a way of making sure that we all still move towards the objective, even though we kind of hated each other, <laughs> even though we kind of weren't in love with each other. But it's all about the goal. Well, what is the goal? What is the goal? The goal is love. The goal is unconditional love. That is the way of the kingdom. God started talking to us about not sacrificing the way of the kingdom for the objective of the kingdom. But it's got to flow out of unconditional love. And you know what, you guys? You know what this did in our lives? And it was so painful for me, but it slowed everything down. And all of a sudden, I had to start getting confronted about my own role as a husband and my role as a father. And that was a spooky thing for me because I could do my ministry thing, you know, and get by pretty quick. But man, your family will keep you honest. You know what I'm talking about? You know, your family, your children, when you have to look your child in the eye and acknowledge that you have done something unkind, that you have misrepresented the character of God to your own child. I mean, Ken and I were just doing this a few days ago at the Strand where we were just weeping together over some stuff 
that she experienced when she was a little baby that she probably doesn't remember in her mind, but that she, her soul will have a memory of that I had to take responsibility for. Another layer of something Cora and I are diving into, I realized, man, I really, I dropped the ball on that. I did not represent the character of God to my own child. And, uh, and we had to work through that. Hey, Kiana, hey, and she forgave me because she loves me. <laughs> Jesus said to, to Cora and I, when your children are flourishing, you will be bearing the kind of fruit that I love. Man, that was a confronting one for me. It's like, it's so much easier to just check out of the building of my family and go do something impressive over here with ministry. But what if the ministry that, what if, what if actually the fruit that God really wants is what flows out of that context of covenant to love? Because that, that is the picture, you know? We, like, we didn't choose this, these metaphors. We didn't design marriage. We're not the ones that, that chose the metaphor of husband and wife for our connection, our connection with God. He chooses these metaphors. He said, it's like you're my bride. It's like you're my child. That's what it's like. And you know what? God is so open about his emotions. Have you noticed that about God? In Ephesians 4, it talks a lot about speaking the truth to each other in love. And this is where I want to kind of wind up and get to our application tonight. Um, just hope and see what the Spirit wants to do in the room. And I think it will be unique for all of us. But Ephesians talks to us about being real with each other. And through the process of actually speaking the truth to each other. Man, this i got to tell you guys something. If you could have shown me a video of, of me saying this right now to me, like... 10 or even five or six years ago, I would, my jaw would have hit the floor. Like this has been such a painful journey for me to learn to actually love myself and love the people around me enough to speak the truth in love. And when we think of the truth, we tend to think of like holy truths, important truths, like doctrinal truths, you know, <laughs> holy things, or like ministry callings and stuff. But what kind of truth does the Father and His Son and the Spirit speak to us? What kind of truths are they constantly speaking to us? They're talking about their feelings. Have you noticed that? Constantly, God is talking about how He feels, His emotions. And we tend to think, oh, I'm not going to burden, I'm not going to burden this person with what I feel. Man, I'll tell you what, that is so out of whack with the character of God. What does the Father say when Jesus comes up out of the water? He says, this is my Son, whom I bestow upon the qualification of prophet to the nations. Listen to him. That's not what, he doesn't list his credentials. He says, this is my boy, and he makes me happy. This is my boy, and he pleases me. He expresses his emotion. He tells us how Jesus makes him feel. And we're waiting for the real thing that he's going to say. Okay, that's cool. But where's the real? And that's it. He says, that he, and, he, and it's like Jesus is going, do you guys get it? This is what it's all about. Me and my dad are freaking crazy about each other. I can't do anything apart from God. Now, think about this for a second. Can you do something apart from your connection with the Father? I mean, are there plenty of human beings on this planet who are doing stuff without connection to the Heavenly Father? Yes, absolutely. So what did Jesus mean when he said, I cannot do anything apart from my connection with my Heavenly Father? You know, I would submit to you what he means is if I, if I am not experiencing unconditional love from my dad, I got nothing to offer you. Do you see that? If I am not bathed up to my eyeballs in my dad's affection and love and, and honor and pleasure, then I have got nothing good I can offer anybody. And, and if that's true for Jesus, how more true is that for us, friends? You know, and so, so here we've got this, the model that Jesus is giving us is speaking the truth to each other about how we feel. And you know what? I, we, Cor and I are on this journey. We're learning, and we're on this journey with this DTS. And this is how we lead DTSs these days, these days is basically get everybody being totally 
loving and real with each other. And then the discipleship just, it just goes boom. And, I, and now as the DTS leader, I'm hearing like, whoa, like you did that and these students did that and you guys discipled the heck out of each other and then Jesus is happy and it's awesome, you know. And we see, we see in that scripture that what the whole plan is when two people who are different, and I mean the most fundamental difference, male and female, right? Marriage is the most powerful picture of this, but it's in friendship too. Two human beings who look at each other and say, you, no matter what, we are going to stay connected, even when you drive me nuts. And I'm going to be real with you. I'm going to be loving. I'm not going to judge you. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about going to each other and saying, you don't love me. You don't this. You know, I feel like you suck. You know, I feel like you're jealous. <laughs> or I perceive all of this crap in your life. You know, like, hey, I want to speak the truth to you, brother. I perceive that you are full of judgment. You know, I perceive all this. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay, what I'm talking about is fighting for the connection. And saying to somebody, this is me and Joseph do this. Hey, Joseph. You know, Joseph did this to Cor and I a few nights ago where something that we did, he didn't like, it, it, it didn't feel right to him. And he's under our care right now. I like to say he's over our leadership. He's standing on our leadership. And it didn't feel right for him. And he came to us because he values our connection that much. And he said, hey, can I be honest with you? I don't have a comment about the state of your heart. I don't have a judgment or an opinion about what's in your heart, but can I tell you how what you did made me feel? This is what Jesus does to you and I, right? Believes the highest of us and lets us know exactly how what we're doing is impacting his heart. I mean, geez, man, we've got the prophets going, when you did that, I felt like a husband with a prostitute for a wife. I mean, that's pretty full on. Have you ever said that to somebody? Well, I'll tell you what, there's the model right there. <laughs> Apparently, it's okay. God does it. <coughs> you know? And so Joseph is fighting for the connection. And I'm going, come on. Bring it on. Don't judge me. If you judge me, I'll, I'll tell you to leave. I don't want people around me who judge my heart. That's not what I need. But if you want to come and talk to me about how what I'm doing is how that's making you feel, how that's impacting our connection, come on, bring it on, because I want to grow I want to learn. And if nobody has the courage, if nobody has the love to actually tell me how my behavior is impacting them, how am I supposed to grow? Do you see that? When you, and we think that it's such a, we think that it's such a beautiful and powerful thing to go, no, I don't want to burden this person with my emotions. No, I don't want to talk to them about that. And really what you're doing is robbing this person of the growth that is their inheritance in Christ. Where you have, a, you have the power to help this person be transformed in the, in the image of Christ. And I'll tell you what, you guys. If the standard that Jesus sets is perfect, unconditional love, if that's what he says that he is hoping for 2,000 years ago, then does that also connect with you why he said, shoot, you are going to need to forgive 77 times 7 times like a day. Do you see that? Forgiveness becomes a way of life to stay connected to stay connected. Because you know what happens, you guys? If we don't forgive, it becomes restrictive in your movement and you become wounded and walls come up. And then when you need your heart, and I'm telling this to guys all the time and doing, dude, I'm saying guys, single guys, I'm saying practice this now because shoot, when you get married, you're going to need your heart. You're going to need it to be alive. Hey, babe, Cora had to deal with a husband whose heart was on the shelf in a dusty old box. And she had to love me through that. And I had to grow up and actually get in touch with my own heart in order to be able to love. And here I thought I was protecting everybody and protecting myself. And the truth was, actually, I was just shutting off love. And so we've been, we're embracing this way of life where every time we experience something, you know, that is less than unconditional love, we're learning to forgive. And I'll tell you what, you, you, there's a big difference between excusing someone's behavior and embracing, hey, that's, that's not okay, but I forgive you. Do you see that? See the difference? You can't forgive somebody and excuse their behavior at the same time, can you? You can't say, it's okay, and I forgive you. The pathway to forgiveness is to start by saying, you know what, that's actually not okay. It's actually not okay. But wait a minute, I'm on my high horse. Who am I to say that that's not okay? Well, you know what, you're a child of God. Yeah, you've been unkind to other people as well. 
But you've got to steward your heart and say, you know what? That's not okay what that person did, but I forgive you, Dad. I forgive you, Matt. <laughs> I forgive you. <laughs> so, I mean, as you can see, I could probably talk forever about this stuff. Um, but I feel like, I feel like we're catching um, this. And um, I'm just, I'm just I'm feeling the Spirit of God, you know, exhorting all of us to keep the main thing the main thing. The priority of God has always been and it always will be your covenantal relationships. Who are the people? You know what I mean? We get so hung up on what we do, on what we're going to do, what my calling is. And you know what? Biblically, you guys, what's far more significant than that is who you do it with and the quality of your connection with the people that you do it with, that you stay connected. That's really our <coughs> fundamental, most foundational calling on earth. Um, so... Yeah, get married. <laughs> Stay married. You know what happens? What's that, Tim? And make babies. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Is that where you're going? Oh, good. Um, have you noticed that? That, baby, that, the, that actually, you know, this relation, I'm doing it. There it is. I do it. Somebody recently did an impersonation of me, and they were doing this, and I was like, I don't do that. That's ridiculous. Who would do that? And I just saw myself doing it. <laughs> Blast it all. <laughs> mm. When you get married, when you say to somebody, we're going to stay connected, there's three possible outcomes. You're either going to get divorced, which is in our day and age, unfortunately, absolutely rampant. I've had six close friends get divorced who, who have been married more recently than Cora and I, and I'm 32 years old. Um, you're either going to get divorced, you're going to get emotionally divorced. How I many of you know what I'm talking about? How I many of you know, you know, don't put your hand up, but you may have been raised in a family where mom and dad were emotionally divorced. You're either going to get divorced, you're going to get emotionally divorced. What's the third option? You're going to grow. You're going to grow if you're willing to be known, if you're willing to expose the truth about what's really going on inside of you, you're going to grow. So I just want to submit that to you, friends. Can we get those, um, those questions up there? So there's a few of them. Uh, do we have the other ones as well, or just those two? Oh, we'll kind of scroll through them. OK, cool. So maybe we'll just kind of scroll through these. And I just wanted to give everybody a chance. Maybe we'll, we'll go through them together quickly. Is this, Hannah, is this all right? Are we OK for time? OK, cool. Thank you. Um, is there someone in your life? These are just, this is just about doing business with God. Remember I started by just saying, dude, let's just repent. Come on, it's good for us. You know what I mean? Like, you, who wants freedom, right? The best way to get freedom, the best way to get freedom is just like David prayed, Holy Spirit, shine that big old spotlight in my heart and just expose me. You know, just expose me because I want my, I want my connection with the Father and the people around me to go deeper. Is there someone in your life that you've wronged and you need to humble yourself before them? These are hard-hitting questions. Is there someone in your life who's hurt you, and you need to call a spade a spade, little Aussieism that I learned. <laughs> you need to call a spade a spade, then forgive them. Because remember, you can't forgive them if you don't acknowledge that, yeah, what that person did to me is wrong. I struggled with this one, to actually look it in the face and go, you know what? Actually, that was wrong. That person, hey, see you guys. See you, Jeff and Yvonne. <laughs> cool. Um, is there someone in your life who you've judged or been bitter against and it's time to let it go? Is there someone in your life who you feel hurt by and you need to tell them the truth and give them a chance to love you? Have you noticed that? Some of us, man, we, need, like, we, we don't give people the chance to actually love us well by exposing the truth of what we actually need in the connection. You may feel that way towards your leader where you go, oh, I can't, I don't want to burden my leader with my heart. And I'll tell you what, if your leader doesn't care about your heart, follow someone else. You know? I mean, I tell that to people following me. Like, if you pick up at some point that I don't care about your heart, like, follow somebody else. Your, your leaders, in this context, I can just about promise you, your leader's not going to be burdened by your heart, friends. Share, if you bring it in a humility and in gentleness and not in judgment, but in, but in truth, in love, your leader's going to, you're, you're going to grow. You're going to get closer. Have you carried bitterness in your heart towards God? over a situation, and it's time to let go of your judgment against him and start asking for understanding. So just some questions, you guys. The answer to these may all be no. I don't know. 
Just bring him before the Holy Spirit and, uh, and just see what he does. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that good? Cool. Maybe we could get some like, oh, thanks, guys. Um, maybe we could get some like moody music going or something. <laughs> something to get us all really repenty. Um, yeah, so let's just, we'll scroll through those and just ponder them. If you, I mean, feel free to do business now, too. You know, if, you, if there's somebody you want to connect with or even just get into pairs or chalk stuff through, feel free to do that. But I'll just leave it, leave it to let the Holy Spirit move amongst us how he wants to. Love you guys so much, eh? It's such a privilege to be here. There's so much favor of God on you as a community. You probably don't actually even realize, do you? When you're outside of Wyoming Townsville, you actually realize, holy smokes, like, there is so much favor on you guys. It's epic, you know, and it's so, it's such an honor to even be a part of the same family <coughs> as you guys. It's a point. I constantly, if I'm at the hairdresser, I probably just start talking about what you do and just say, this is, they ask me what I do, and I'm like, talk about what Hannah does. I'm like, I'm with her, you know. <laughs> so I'm not even kidding. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Holy Spirit. But let's just say yes to the Lord, shall we? Maybe that's the right place to end. Can we just... We just come before you, Holy Spirit, and we just say yes. We just say yes to your conviction, yes to your love, yes to your confrontation. You discipline the ones you love. We trust you, God. Amen.